Hi everybody, I'm David Sanders and today we're going to finish the first module of the course with um, carrying on from where Alan left off on Tuesday about finding structure in data. So, so far we've been looking at images as sources of data, but of course there are lots of other kinds of data around. We're going to look at finding structure in data and the technique we're going to use to do that is called principal component analysis. So we'll be looking at the intuition behind this technique more than the actual technical details, but it's based, uh, the, actual, the actual calculation of this method is based around the SVD that Alan was talking about. But we are going to look at how we could actually approach it from a more computational point of view rather than linear algebra, which we'll leave for a linear algebra course. Okay, so let's look at um, multiplication tables again. So in particular, we'll look at uh, flags and you'll be doing some more flags in the homework. So let's recall that a multiplication table is also called an outer product. And so if we define this function outer of V and W, two vectors, it just takes all of the products, all of the multiplications of all of the elements of V with all of the elements of W. And so we get this nice table, uh, just like we learnt at elementary school. And so here's the 10 by 10 multiplication table. And many flags are actually examples of this. So here's a flag. I just took the outer product of this vector with three components, 1, 0, 0.1 and 2, with this vector 1s of 6. So what is 1s of 6? Just to remind you, it actually makes a vector with six components, all of which are 1, equal to 1. So, uh, by the way, this actually creates the vector in memory, whereas, as we saw with Alan uh, on Tuesday, it would be possible to make a type in Julia where it was not necessary to actually store these values in memory, and, uh, and there are packages that do that. Or you could write your own uh, in the homework. And so we're just going to look at, we can, you know, we can go backwards and forwards between looking at tables of numbers and viewing them as images just by making the, the numbers correspond to colors in some way. So here I've just colored the, the, this, this data and we see that it looks like some flags of various countries around the world. Okay, but this, this is not the most general kind of multiplication table. What is a more general kind of multiplication table? We can have, so the, the, the thing about this flag is that each column of the flag is exactly identical. But a general multiplication table will have almost the same columns in each column is almost the same but it can be multiplied by a number as well and that extra number that's multiplying e each column can be multiplied by a different number and those multiples are actually what are stored in the other vector and so this first vector is giving me the column and this second vector is giving me the amount that i'm multiplying each column by and so this is sort of the general how a general rank one matrix will look. So we're going to call a matrix rank one if it can be written as exactly one multiplication table in this way. So rank is a concept that comes from linear algebra, but we can just understand it like that. Basically, how many different kinds of columns are there in the matrix? But we're going to regard two columns as being the same if one is a multiple of the other, or if one is a sum of the uh, of two other columns, for example. Okay, so we're not going to go into, into the linear algebra. So let's just look at what a general multiplication table or rank one matrix looks like. So here I've drawn one. I just took basically random numbers uh, for each of the two vectors. So there's 50 random numbers in the vertical direction and 500 in the horizontal direction. And it looks like this. So it's basically some kind of stripes and, uh, you know, thick stripes, thin stripes, block, a block, this block structure. That, that is what a general multiplication table or rank one matrix looks like if I view it as an image. Okay. So now, you know, nothing in the world of real data, we never have perfect data. This is a perfect rank one matrix. What happens if I perturb, if I, add some noise to this matrix. So here I've added a little bit of noise to the matrix, just some random numbers that are, you know, add a little random number here, subtract it there, and this is what it looks like. And if you 
just look visually it's sort of almost the same as the, the previous image is or almost the same images and so if I give you this table of data it is not a rank one matrix I cannot write it exactly as a multiplication table I would have to use a sum of several different multiplication tables to represent this matrix but it's clear that it's almost the same as a single one it's almost a rank one matrix it's so we could say that it, you know it's uh, in some sense we could say that its numerical rank is close to one or is equal to one but how could we actually discover that if I give you this table how can you actually find that it is that it has this really nice structure which means that I can represent it with much less information how would you actually go about finding that so that's what we're going to do so let's treat the image as a matrix of data again and I'm just going to take for now the first two rows of the image so I've just shown a small piece of the first two rows of the image here as an image and here as as the actual data inside the image and okay then what are we going to do we're actually going to think of these two vectors the top row and then the second row we're going to think of those as two vectors of numbers and so I've called them xx and yy and we're going to think of those as coordinates in two dimensions and we're going to plot each of these vectors which are the columns of the um, of the image so basically we're thinking of this data as uh, as now made up of a lot of different columns and we want to know how are those columns related to each other in the end that's what you know this rank concept is about for example can we show that all of these columns are just multiples of the same vector in that case it will be a rank one matrix so the way we're going to do that for now is visually we're just going to plot the data so we haven't looked at plots yet in this course but of course plotting is a key part of scientific computing and Julia has several libraries that we could use for plotting data but we're going to use one called plots.jl a very nice simple name to remember so let's load that package in of course you need to install it if you don't already have it um, and then we'll load it with the standard using plots command and now I'm going to plot the data so I'm going to draw points you know on a, just like a standard graph I'm going to draw points at coordinates given by you know x i and y i where x i is the x sub i is the i -th element of the vector and I get this result so these this is a load of points there's some 500 points in this image and we see that visually we can just see immediately that they all lie along a single straight line in this in this plane right so again what am I doing uh, so I you know, should uh, as usual in when we draw a plot I should add labels to the axes so I can just put um, x label equals you know x values and y label equals y values so not very uh, informative labels and we see that the axes labels get get put on there so again what are we what are we actually seeing here we're seeing the columns of this the, the these two rows of the image as vectors in space right so that's a very useful way of thinking about data just to plot it plot the different coordinates in different directions and now let's add in not only the original exact rank one image but also the perturbed noisy version of that image again the first two rows of that noisy image and it looks like this right so the original rank one is still this perfect straight line and now the noisy image with this extra you know randomness but it's a small amount of randomness actually falls around that straight line close to the straight line and so if you if I just give you that data set you know that looks like this you can just immediately spot by eye oh that looks like all of the data is close to a straight line okay so by visually as long as we're in two or three dimensions visually we can actually just see the structure of the data but of course if we then want to go to higher dimensions we can no longer plot the data and then we will have to use numerical techniques so I just made a little visualization where I can actually move around in this data set plotting you know highlighting each point just you know it might be useful to see this visualization and realize that what we're doing is highlighting 
each column of the data set, right? Where is each column? And you can see that basically they lie along this line, but they're bouncing around a bit because of the noise, the random noise. Okay, so now what are we going to do? So we actually want to do something quantitative. We want to quant quantify how big is this data set? Which direction does it lie in? That's what we're aiming to do now. So how can we go about that? So, you know, if you just look at this data, well, so what we want to know is the size of it. So how wide is this data set? How tall is it? But, but the data set is, has this noise, right? So I might have, so, so, you know, one thing you could do is just take the extreme values. So for example, the biggest and smallest. So here's the most extreme point, the furthest out. And I could just say, oh, the width of the data is given by the position of that point or the X coordinate of that point. But actually, there might be an outlier, so a data point which is you know, far outside where most of the data is, over here somewhere, and that would not be representative of the size of the data set. So I actually want to use statistical techniques. I want to take some kind of average over the whole data set. Okay, so um, the first thing we're going to do is center the data set, also called demeaning. So I'm gonna subtract the mean from the data. So I'm gonna subtract the mean in the X direction and subtract the mean in the y direction. And this function mean in Julia is defined in the statistics standard library package. Because it's a standard library package, you do not need to install it. So just to comment, people uh, get confused about this. When you do package.add, pkg.add, that downloads a package from the internet and installs it on your, your computer. You only need to do that once in your in each installation of Julia. But then using actually loads in the, the package, loads in the functions that are defined inside that code. And it does that, and you need to do that in every session of Julia. So package.add only once and using every time. But because statistics is a standard library package, we do not actually need to install it. It comes by default with Julia. And that's what provides this mean function and the other function I'll use in a minute. So we can see that indeed, the data is not symmetric, it's not exactly symmetric, there's no corresponding outlier uh, point over here, but it's approximately symmetric and it is centered nicely now around zero. So now what do we want to do? We want to find how wide is this data set? So we can do that using various techniques. For example, you could think of, so the problem is if I, now just calculate the mean, of course I'm going to get zero because uh, there's as much data on the left as there is on the right. So what I need to do is find the displacement from the origin and I want to make that positive, a positive amount and then average that, those positive displacements. So I could, for example, take the absolute value of the displacement or distance of each point from the origin. That's a, a completely plausible and, and good measure, but it's not the usual thing that people do. The usual technique is to square the distances. And when I square the distances, that also makes them positive. But then because I squared them, I need to take the square root afterwards. And so this is what um, we mean by the standard deviation. And we're going to do this separately for the X coordinates and the Y coordinates. So basically what we're doing is this kind of projection that I've drawn here. So we have this data cloud and we're projecting, we're squashing down onto the X axis. And then we have a new data cloud that is only along the x-axis and we want to find the width of that cloud or, or an approximation or some kind of measurement of the width of that cloud. And so we're going to use this standard deviation. So we can now calculate that because we already centered the data, we can now calculate that just by taking the squares of each element and taking the mean of those and then taking the square root of the result. And that gives me the standard deviation. If I don't take the square root, I get the variance. So I've done that in each of these directions. I called them width and height. And now I'm gonna plot them on this same graph. So what I'm actually plotting here is, here's the mean at zero. And these dotted lines or dashed lines are actually at two standard deviations away on either side of zero. So why do I take two standard deviations? And the answer is because we know that um, usually the amount of data within the mean plus or minus two standard deviations should be about 95% or 96% of the data. So almost all of the data is com contained within two standard deviations, whereas about 70% is contained within one standard deviation. 
So this assumes that the, the data is normally distributed. So, um, but you can see, for example, in this case, that there are a couple of data points that are actually just outside this, this measure. Right? So this is not a bound. I'm not saying that all the data is contained within this. I'm saying that most of the data that this measures, are good. this gives me a good measurement for the region that contains most of the data. Okay, great. So we now know, and I do the same in the y direction. And now, so I now know, you know, a box that where the data is contained. But if I look at this picture again, I'm not happy because this box is clearly not telling me everything about the data. Why? Because I actually have correlations in the data. So what does that mean? It means that literally they're co-related. In other words, uh, they're related to one another. What, in what way? Well, if the x coordinate is very low, very ne or very you know very negative, then the y coordinate is also negative. If the x coordinate is positive, then the y coordinate is also positive. And so, you know, uh, the, this box, for example, would equally well describe. Uh, a data set which was oriented in the other direction, diagonally in the other direction. And so I'm missing some information about this correlation, and that's what I need to calculate. So standard statistical methods tell us how to calculate the, that correlation, but we're not going to, to use them because they, they contain, you, know, you need more concepts. Instead, we'll just, just look at the data and do a computational approach, which will amount to doing this standard statistical calculation, of course but we're just going to do it in a more intuitive way. So let's draw the data set again, but now we'll add this arrow. So here I've added a red arrow and we're going to rotate the arrow around. And you can see that some directions of the arrow, well, lie along the directions that this data set is basically pointing, whereas other directions of the arrow are far away from the data set. And so on the right, what I've drawn is the same data set again, but I've rotated it round exactly the right amount so that if the arrow is at, at an angle, if you rotate your head so that the arrow looks, the red arrow on the left looks horizontal, then what, how will you see the data now? That's what I've drawn on the right. And then the green lines are actually measuring the width of the data in that direction. So the width of the data projected onto that line. And so as I move the arrow around, you can see that, well, the data, of course, rotates around and there's some direction where the width in that direction, you know, viewed from that direction or projected onto that direction is actually very small. And there's another direction where it's very large. And so, well, these two directions are actually key. The, the direction where this data is widest or spread out most and the direction where it's spread out the least. So let's draw that function, right? That's a function now. I'm, you know, uh, I'm not showing you how exactly to calculate these, but it's just literally projecting however you do that, rotating the data, projecting, and then taking the standard deviation and two times the standard deviation gives me this width. And so I'm actually going to plot the variance rather than the standard deviation. And it looks like this nice sinusoidal curve. And we see that there are two values, so I got theta, the angle of this vector on the x-axis and the variance on the y-axis. You can see that there are two angles where it is maximized, basically pointing along this direction and then the opposite direction as well. Right? So those are the two directions along which it's maximized and there are two directions along which it's minimized as well. So what I basically need, want to do is find those directions, the maximum direction and the minimum direction. So I have a function and I want to optimize it. I want to minimize it and maximize it. So there are very many numerical methods which enable me to do this in the literature. For now, the easiest thing to do is just literally calculate that function at, you know, sample that function at a lot of points and then take the biggest one and the smallest one. That's what I decided to do. And um, just, and then, yeah. So this picture shows those directions. So here is the direction where I calculated the biggest variance, right? So that's basically the direction along which the data stretches out the most. And this other direction is the direction in which it stretches out the least. And what you can see just visually is that these directions have a very special property. They are actually perpendicular to each other. That is not unique to this, uh, this particular data set, that is always going to be the case because of the way we calculated these quantities 
And that's what you know, statistics and linear algebra show. So what we are actually doing by doing this procedure is the following. We're actually taking my data set and fitting an ellipse around it of this size. And uh, so the directions of the axes of the ellipse that we just found by this optimization procedure are called the principal components, and that's what we're finding. And we also want to know not only the directions, but also the size in each of those directions, the length or the width. And what we see is that in this particular data set, the smallest uh, width of this axis of the ellipse is very much smaller than the, than the big one. And that is what enables us to say, oh, in that case, I could just basically say that the data is all aligned basically along this one principal direction. That is the idea of principal components now component analysis, okay, in, in a visual and, math and, and computational way. And then the, the, the linear algebra tells me, you know, much more detail about how to actually compute that in the general case. So let's just visualize the same thing in higher dimensions. So let's go to three dimensions. So I'm going to take, you know, I, I could take the three first rows of my image, but instead I'm just going to make uh, two new matrices. One of them is rank one, so uh, just a single multiplication table plus noise. And the other is rank two, two the sum of two multiplication tables, again, plus noise. And so I've drawn them here in three dimensions now. So this is drawing the X, Y, and Z coordinates, which are the first three rows of the, the table. And I'm just gonna rotate them around and you can see that there's a difference in these two kinds of matrices. So one of them looks like a plane with some noise, that's rank two, and the other one looks like a line with some noise, that's rank one. The blue one is like a line, whichever direction I rotate it around, it just, it, it never spreads out. Whereas the red one spreads out over a plane in, when I look at it from certain directions. And so that's, that's what rank two and rank one really mean in geometric terms. And so again, if we tried to fit a now an ellipsoid, a three-dimensional ellipse to this data, in the case of the rank one, I would get one very elongated direction and two, two very small squashed directions. And in the case of the plane, I would get two big directions and one small direction. And that is what enables me to say, is this data approximately two dimensional, a plane or approximately one dimensional? And then in higher dimensions, I can no longer visualize anything, but I can still do the calculation in exactly the same way. And that enables me to say, oh, look, this data in which I thought was in 10 dimensions is actually lives on a three dimensional region or space in that, inside that 10 dimensional set. So to finish, let's look at an actual application of these ideas to a simple recommendation engine. So let's suppose that you and some friends review some movies and you give them a score from one to five, but you don't review all the movies. And so there's gonna be some missing data, which we can represent in Julia with this special type called special value called missing, and that is actually of type missing with a capital N. And so this matrix, uh, the, the, the type of thing that can be stored inside this matrix is either missing or integer, and union means one or the other. And so what I want to do is approximate this matrix with a rank two matrix, for example, a rank one or a rank two or a rank K matrix, and then use that to actually fill in the missing values, which are going to be then recommendations for me whether I want to watch that movie or not. So this is called data imputation when I fill in missing values. And so I've drawn the, the, the data table here with black for the missing values. And so the idea is going to be, well, I want to work out, you know, is this movie somehow like a drama or a comedy and does this person like dramas or comedies or does, does this person like this particular actor? And so the machine learning um, method that we're going to use should be able to somehow uh, automatically extract that, that information. And so what, what we do is basically the, the idea of the SVD, which is we're going to approximate the non-missing values with a rank two matrix. So we need to find a way to take a rank two matrix and find the distance of that rank two matrix from my data and then minimize that distance. And so, the sim so that's again an optimization problem and the simplest way you could do that is with gradient descent, which is what I actually did. And the result looks like this. And so, um, so I actually drew those again now with black 
where the missing values are. And you can see that it has not completely, so the top is the original data and the bottom is the rank two approximation. You can see, for example, that this red pixel up here is not correctly represented. So it's not exact, it's not, it's not that great. You could do a higher rank approximation and that would be better. Um, but you can, you can start to get a feel for how these methods can actually be useful to analyze real data. So for example, this was used to solve the Netflix challenge of uh, like 10 years ago.